بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر اسٹوڈنٹس آئی ہوپ آل آف یو اینڈ یور لو ونز وڈ بی ڈوئنگ فائن اینڈ انجوائنگ گڈ ہیلتھ ایز موسٹ آف یو آر فیملیئر ود دی آن گوئنگ سچویشن ان پاکستان اینڈ دی ریگارڈنگ کرونا وائرس اینڈ دی سبسیکوینٹ کلوجر آف دی اکیڈمک انسٹیٹیوٹس ان پاکستان سو اسٹل دیر از اے پاسبلٹی دیٹ دی انسٹیٹیوٹس مائڈ ناٹ be open after 31st of May and uh, the online classes might be resumed after that. So keeping that in view we would uh, start preparing lectures for you guys. So in our today's lecture uh, we would talk about the development of Cold War in Asia. In our previous discussions we have discussed about the development and origin of cold war in the european continent so in in today's lecture we will have a thorough discussion about uh, how the cold war developed in asian continent This 
Soviet was sending support to Chairman Mao and Chairman Mao promised land for all and to make sure nobody went hungry. On the other hand, the Chiang Kai Shek was a uh, like professional military man. He went to many academies to study military strategies. He's been supported by the U.S. and uh, aid was also sent to him by the Americans to help feed the people. But most of the money has been exploited by the high officials, by the Chiang kai party. The U.S. refused to send troops as a result to aid the corrupt leader, leaving the Chinese a choice of corruption and greed or land and food. The Chinese Civil War has been regarded as the very beginning of the Cold War in Asia. While the two superpowers, the US and the Soviets, seem to respectively support opposite national parties, the US supported the Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang Party led by the Chiang Kai-shek, and the Chairman Mao was supported by the Soviet Union. Both the US and the Soviets didn't directly intervene the war by sending forces. They also didn't clandestinely engage in the heated competition for sphere of influence on Chinese soil. Rather, their separate national interest in China primarily determined their actions in the civil war. For instance, the U.S. pursued its long-standing commercial interest and also had a strategic interest in strong China that would be able to fill a power vacuum caused by the absence of Japan in China in post-war period. When we look at the bilateral history of China and Japan, we come to know that they hardly had cordial relations with each other. They had almost similar sort of relationship, bilateral relationship, which both India and Pakistan have with each other. So, and before uh, the Second World War, Japan used to be a great power of Asia as compared to China. So it was anticipated by the American that the power vacuum which was created by the Japanese can be filled by the Chinese. While the Soviet Union tried to establish a buffer zone to secure the railway and ports in Manchuria and Xinjiang for its security and special interest. Okay, before going further, uh, it is necessary for us being a student of international relations to look into the history of uh, uh, nowadays and Asian republics and the Xinjiang autonomous region, nowadays Xinjiang autonomous region of China. Nowadays Central Asian republics used to be a part of Soviet Union. They remain under the direct control of Soviet Union for almost 70 years and uh, nowadays China, Xinjiang Autonomous Region and uh, Afghanistan along with nowadays Central Asian Republics, they used to be a part of Greater Turkestan and this whole region was predominantly a Muslim dominated region. So the Soviets had some like 
concerns about the security situation in Xinjiang. Their focus on individual interests could sufficiently explain the reason why both the US and the Soviets advocated a coalition government of the Kuomintang and the Chinese Communist Party. Why the Soviet Union maintained recognition of the Republic of China, um, which is also like uh, the government which was installed in Taiwan, which was also called Formosa. Even when the communist forces won victory in 1949, so as to avoid provoking U.S. military intervention and why the U.S. withdrew from the civil war to prevent the loss of American prestige and resources. Now we will talk about the U.S. concern over China falling to communist ideology. There are two timelines which are referred to the time period of Chinese civil war. One is that it started before the Second World War in 1927 between the nationalist and communist led by Chiang Kai-shek and Chairman Mao, respectively. And the other is the other dominant timeline for the Chinese civil war is that it lasted from 1945 to 1945 till the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1st October 1949. So before the Second World War, the, during the Chinese Civil War, the nationalists had the advantage. The two sides joined forces to fight against the Japanese in World War II because uh, they always had enemy to China, always had enemical relations with the Japanese. So fighting resumed of the Second World War, the communists picked up momentum during this time and they emerged as victorious in the Chinese Civil War. And ultimately, Chairman Mao won the election and Chiang Kai-shek fled to Taiwan, which is also called a former South. But ironically, the ROC got recognition as a sovereign independent state by the Americans and in the United Nations it has been regarded as a sovereign independent state rather than the PRC which is mm, like uh, having government over most of the territory of the mainland China. In Taiwan, they consider themselves uh, the Chiang Kai-shek, the rightful government of China. So the U.S. got very much conscious about this development because communism took over the country with the largest population in the world. And uh, at that time, communism now controlled over one fourth of the world's land and almost one third of the population. So the U.S. policymakers became very conscious about this development, and they started focusing on the policy of containment now in the Asian. So here we will, uh, it is imperative for us to talk about 
the domino theory. It is a very renowned theory in the international politics and according to this theory, if one country falls to a particular ideology, in that case, if one country falls to communism, there will be a high probability that it will push the other countries around it to soon fall to communism as well. So there was a fear in the American circles that if China falls to communism, the other countries around China, such as Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Burma, and India, they might also fall to communist philosophy and they might join the communist ideology. So they became the US policy makers got concerned about this very development and they tried to contain this spread of communism through the policy of containment in Asia. So we have already discussed the containment, the US policy of communism. First it was taken for the containment of communism in the European continent. But as China being one of the most highly populated country for to the communism philosophy of joined the communist ideology, the US started to deploy the policy of containment in the Asian continent. So there was a great discussion in the American policy makers that we need to keep communism inside the boundaries of the Soviet Union. about the U.S. reversal of occupation policy in Japan and the Korean War. The skepticism was formed between the two superpowers after their cooperation failed in the Chinese Civil War. And eventually, the defenses were highlighted by the deadlock over prestige in the split Korean Peninsula in mid-1947. Efforts made by the Allied powers were continuously challenged by the arbitrary groups of the Soviets. A post-war plan of creating a five-year provisional Korean government with a full power trusteeship and a later resolution of the United Nations General Assembly that required a peninsula wide elections for the National Assembly with an establishment of the supervisory body were formally discarded as the Soviet established the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in the North in September 1948 against the Arab support Republic of Korea. So this growing mistrust between the U.S. and the Soviet had soon evolved into a palpable competition, albeit with caution from the U.S. reversal of its occupation policy in Japan in October 1948 that culminated in the end of the Japanese occupation in 1942 to the two superpowers in direct conflict in Korean War, which lasted from 1950 to 1950. So eventually, the Allied part of the Second World War decided to split Korea into two parts, the North and the South. 
the North was inspired by the communist ideology and was aided by the Soviet Union, which was leading the Soviet bloc of communism. On the other hand, the South was nationalist and supported by the United States of America. The country was divided at the 28th parallel on June of 1950. The North invaded the South and a war broke out between the North and South. and they pushed forward into the south with the help from the Soviets and the United States convinced the United Nations to aid in war effort and uh, troops of a troop by the United Nations sent to the Korea led by the Americans. President Truman, the then President of the United States, did not get a formal declaration of war, but still deployed troops. As far as the war matters are concerned, when we talk about the U.S. Constitution, it is the U.S. is not empowered to decide whether to launch a war against a particular country. It has to get approval, it has to be approved, such sort of uh, decisions has to be approved by the Senate. So in that case, the President Truman formal declaration of war was not ratified by the Senate, but still the troops were deployed by the Americans. So, General MacArthur played a very crucial role in this Korean War and uh, he was given the command of the armies fighting the North. He was able to storm back and push the North back to the 38th parallel, but he was Okay, now we will talk about the second stage which is competition, a competition, the stage of probe and test for each other's intentions. The U.S. reversal of occupation policies in Japan and the Korean War. Three characteristics can be noticed in this very stage of competition. The first the suspicions from the two superpowers had been substantiated with careful actions targeted at each other. The second is the goals of each side's cautious move were to avoid confrontations and to serve as a litmus test for each other's intentions. Third is the stage of probe and test for each other's intentions comprised two elements, intentional arrangements and confrontation towards modes. talk about the intentional arrangements and confrontation of the two superpowers from 1948 to 1953 to check with their intentions and intentional arrangements and their calculations. 
starting from October 1948, the U.S. forced reversal in its occupation policy in Japan policies changed from reforming Japan to rebuilding of Japan. This intentional arrangement has been incorporated in the National Security Council of the United States and uh, it was taken under this impression that the U.S. intentions to preserve its global predominance against the Soviet Union by assimilating Japan into the world of capitalism and free trade. In June 1950, Truman's statement targeted at communism containing an order of dispatching the Soviet salmon fleet to the Taiwan Strait. Second, an order of accelerating military aid to the Philippines and the forces of France and the Associated States in Indochina. And lastly, an order of dispatching a military mission in Indochina. So these intentional arrangements were made by the United States, keeping in view the expanding of communism in this very region. And the U.S. intention to contain this very arrangement had been taken to contain Soviet Union based on an assessment considering the TPRK's onset to be an invasion move of the Soviets designed to undermine U.S. prestige and efforts made to support Japan and the Republic of China. forward in September 1951, the another intentional arrangement which was adopted by the United States is the signing of the San Francisco Treaty to terminate the war between Japan and the Arab powers and to recognize the full sovereignty of the Japanese people. The signing of the U.S. Japanese Security Treaty, Japan granted the right to dispose United States land, air, and sea forces in and about Japan. And the basic objective behind this is that with the outbreak of Korean War, the U.S. intentions to satisfy its security interests and preserve a dominant position in the Korean War by harnessing Japan to its side. So an effort was made by the United States by taking these or by incorporating these developments into their policy so that they can take Japan to its side rather than as their adversary. And finally, in April 1952, the U.S. pressure on Japan to follow suit its economic blockade imposed on China to conclude a peace treaty and establish formal diplomatic relations with the ROC in Taiwan in April 1952. And this is calculation. In the next lecture, we will try to like conclude this discussion by linking it with the Vietnam War, and uh, we will try to continue the development how the Cold War got developed into the continent of Asia. So uh, we will be provided with the reading material and uh, the PowerPoint presentation of this lecture. And so I wish you all stay. I think I do.